We join with the crowd that eagerly awaited the coming of Jesus. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of God. Hosanna in the highest. Fulfilling prophecy, Jesus entered the city riding humbly on a donkey. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of God. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus' followers were excited, filled with anticipation. Yet within a few short days, they were scattered, disillusioned and frightened, unwilling to follow as far as Christ would have them go. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of God. Hosanna in the highest. We too long to join the triumphal procession, only to find ourselves burdened by the past, fearful of the future, reluctant, to accept the way of the cross. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of God. Hosanna in the highest. Yet this Palm Sunday, we receive palm branches, a reminder of the welcome offered to Jesus as he traveled toward the cross. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of God. Hosanna in the highest. Like the crowd in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, We lay down our palm branches and prepare the way for Jesus, shouting, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of God. Hosanna in the highest. Our first reading is an Old Testament reading from Psalm chapter 118, verses 1 through 2 and 19 through 29. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I might enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. 
This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Testament reading is from Luke chapter 19, verses 28 through 40. The gospel reading is Luke's account of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem amid triumph and praise. After he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethphage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. What is this place? I once heard a visitor to this sanctuary say that this sanctuary looks like a spaceship. <laughs> Something from Star Trek or some other futuristic scene. The way this sanctuary is laid out doesn't follow 
the usual patterns. So someone coming here and expecting something else might be surprised in coming in here. But to me, even more surprising than how this space looks are the crazy things that people do when they are here. Waving palms, singing songs, standing up and sitting down and standing again, taking trays from a table and sharing the body and blood of Jesus. If someone were to wander in and witness us, wouldn't they wonder, what is this place? Have you ever encountered a place that shook you up, that involved wonder and awe? I recall a trip I took when I was in the ninth grade to the East Coast. Coming from Idaho, many of the ninth graders who were going on this trip, many of us were riding on the plane for the first time. We got there and marveled at the magnificent architecture that we saw, from the monuments of DC to the towers of New York. The places we had learned about in our history classes now came alive for us as real hustling and bustling places. It made me ask, what is this place? I recall a mission trip to Nicaragua, getting a passport for the first time. Our mission team drove past humble cinder block houses to worship in one-room churches with unfamiliar worship styles and unfamiliar ideas about worship and what worship and faith even mean. And I wondered, what is this place? I recall opening the Bible for the first time, not as, as part of a class or a group study, but simply to read and discover where my faith comes from. I remember discovering that the Bible isn't just a lesson book like it had always seemed, but a vibrant place in its own right, full of mystery and wonder, but also full of discomfort and danger. And I wondered, what is this place? Sometimes a new place can open us up to new possibilities. And sometimes a familiar place in new circumstances can do the same thing. In today's scripture, Jesus and his disciples come to a new place, a place full of awe and wonder, of mystery and inspiration. Some come to Jerusalem for the first time, but others have come many times, now seeing it in new ways. They have come to Jerusalem for a festival. They have come to Jerusalem with a commotion. It shakes people up. Everyone experiences what happened in different ways. And it makes them all ask, what is this place? Jesus arrives in Jerusalem with his disciples, the many, many followers who have joined him along the way. In the book of Luke, Jesus begins the journey to Jerusalem in chapter 9 and finally arrives here in chapter 19. He spent the last 10 chapters preparing for this moment and what it means. I can feel the excitement as they finally near their goal. As they come to Bethphage and Bethany, two towns that are near Jerusalem, I can feel the anticipation. I can imagine the honor 
that two of the disciples felt when Jesus tells them to go ahead and find a colt for Jesus to ride. Following Jesus' instructions, they go into a village, untie the colt, and bring it to Jesus. I also imagine how different people see things in different ways. I imagine what those, the owners of that cult were feeling. How they experienced a familiar place in a new way. Their home suddenly becomes a site for the disciples' adventures. And their home, perhaps a place of safety for them, becomes a place of conflict. The Bible tells us little about the family who owns the cult. I imagine that they work hard and that they feel a sense of pride for their home and their work and the animals that they use for that work. And I imagine that they feel a sense of alarm when they see a pair of intruders coming to untie one of their animals. Why are you untying the colt, they ask in verse 33. The disciples respond the way Jesus tells them to. The Lord needs it. And then they take it away. How do the colt's owners feel about the disciples coming and using it for their own purposes? The Bible doesn't say Perhaps they agree with the disciples and what they're up to and let them go. Perhaps they resign to it. Regardless, Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem, this big event in this new place, sets the scene for some trouble. What is this place? You see... The disciples place Jesus on the colt like a king. And this will not sit well with the current kings of the area. The government of the Roman Empire chooses who ro rules over any region. And they do not choose Jesus. If, if they were to see someone riding in on a colt like a king the Roman rulers would certainly perceive it as a threat. And the entire crowd of disciples treat Jesus like a king, throwing their cloaks on the ground in front of him to form a makeshift red carpet as he rides to his people's capital city. I imagine the people's thrill as they see Jesus ride towards the city's magnificent architecture, I imagine them ready to be ruled by a new king, a king who rules with love and acceptance and justice. I imagine their joy as they shout from Psalm 118, a psalm they have known since childhood. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. To emphasize Jesus as a king, they change a word in the psalm from blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord to blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. The current rulers don't stand a chance because Jesus now comes in glory. I imagine their pride now that after feeling like unimportant, insignificant residents, they receive recognition as full participants with dignity and honor. Jesus will transform Jerusalem into a place where they can live free from their former oppression and burdens. What is this place? I also imagine the fear that some of the disciples bring to the events that they saw unfolding. The actions they saw are dangerous actions. They put all 
of their lives at risk. I imagine their fear that with the wrong moves, they could lose everything they had been working for. If they provoke too much anger, the rulers in Jerusalem could defeat them all. So these disciples, described in verse 39 as Pharisees, say to Jesus, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. Though many people under the current system have no voice, the Pharisees want them to hold off just a little bit longer. Hold off until the time is right. I imagine them wanting to keep things quiet until more favorable circumstances arise. The wondrous places can be dangerous. They can cause upheaval. Is it any wonder that some of the Pharisees wanted to keep the situation under control? The trip to Jerusalem brings wonder and awe to many people. But it does so in different ways to different people. From Jesus to his disciples, to the owners of the cult, to the crowds, to the rulers, to the Pharisees. Some see the place as inspiration. Others see it as a threat. What is this place? When the Pharisees ask Jesus to command his disciples to stop, Jesus responds, I tell you, if these were silence, the stones would shout out. Jesus says that this place, his kingdom, is a place where everyone's voice gets heard. Even if it's uncomfortable. Even if it's different. Even if it means shaking up the status quo and venturing into dangerous territory. When Jesus comes as a king, voices get to shout out, and not just any voices. Jesus also knows the psalm that the crowds shout. It says, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And it also says, the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. The stone that the builders rejected has become the most important stone of the whole place. The stones cry out. The stones that were left out, that were rejected, that were ignored, that were oppressed, now have center stage with Jesus as king. Jesus will continue on Jesus' journey. <clears throat> Jesus will continue on Jesus' journey. Jesus will go to Jerusalem. Jesus will know rejection. Jesus will know crucifixion. Jesus is the rejected stone. And Jesus is the chief cornerstone. So when Jesus comes to town, voices previously left out now have center stage. What is this place? When you look at this sanctuary, what do you see? Is this a familiar space? Is this a, a new space, some place we have never been before? Is it a place of wonder and inspiration? Is it a place of fear and trepidation? What do you see in this space? Do you see Jesus 
leading as a king? Do you see him coming down that aisle of palms that we laid out before him? Do you see him shaking things up, changing things around? Listen. Do you hear the forgotten voices shouting out? Do you hear the ones who have been silenced suddenly finding their voice? If those voices were to keep silence with Jesus as king, even the stones will cry out. What is this place? Amen.